To provide you with a little bit of background on Celligence, they were formed in 2017 within the, in, with the intent of improving quality and compliance and reducing costs for the life science industry in the area of regulatory affairs. They serve some of the top global communities, uh, companies in both device and pharmaceutical sectors. They provide niche regulatory affairs services such as MDR gap analysis, CER writing, device registrations, and other operational and strategic activities required for global device, combination product, and diagnostic compliance. The offices in the US, UK, and India uh, they deli their delivery center in India, combined with the large network of device experts, uh, allows them to provide an onshore offshore model to their clients, which ensures both high quality and cost efficiency. The global team of experts allows you them to support the country specific requirements as needed. That's their map here. Um, and we have a little bit of an MD IVD overview. On this slide, you can see more about the team's expertise in many areas of medical device and diagnostic RA and QA. Um, they have worked with multiple clients in many therapeutical areas, and they also develop technology to improve efficiency in EU MDR compliance operations, specific, specifically focusing on PMS documentation with the guidance of internal team and SME network. The team has produced hundreds of NB approved documents, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you need extra com compliance support. And now on to our presentation, presentation and speaker introduction. Um, as I said, our um, speaker today is Smurduala. Um, she has nine years of medical writing experience, including medical devices and in vitro diagnostics, um, experience expanding different therapeutical areas and all different risk class of devices. And now I will pull up the presentation. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the session on uh, claims. Today, we're going to talk about how to identify uh, relevant claims for your medical device uh, so that the notified body does not raise any questions on your CER or your PER. Uh, so this is applicable to both medical devices and individual diagnostics. Um, but from the presentation perspective, we're going to focus more on the requirements of MDR today. Um, I'd like to start off by just uh, giving the definition of um, a claim as mentioned in the MDR. So MDR Article 7 says that um, the labeling instructions for use, um, anything that cites what the intended purpose of the device is and gives the functions or properties of the device, um, if that ascribes to a function or a property which the device does not have, or if it creates a false impression of either treatment or diagnosis, um, or if it gives any kind of information that is misleading and may cause um, a risk to the patient who's using the device, then it is actionable and it uh, cannot, you cannot make such claims without having proof for it. Um, the other point that you have to consider is that the intended use as specified by the manufacturer and whatever claims uh, surround the device um, is one of the most important points that are evaluated by the notified body when they check clinical evaluation reports. Um, so our goal is to understand how to best state and identify valid device claims. And then the next step would be how to identify um, evidence for these claims to show that these claims are valid and we have a proof that our device performs as intended. Um, so under the EU MDR um, and the MDD, claims can come from any source. It is not limited to the operator's manual or the IFU for the device, but any claim surrounding a device coming from um, any platform, a website, social media, print, newspapers, anything is a valid claim. It, it is something that you should have evidence for. Um, and if we do not have evidence to support this, then it is a problem and it should be taken down from any, um, any of these um, platforms so that it does not create any um, misleading information among the users. 
So you can see uh, that print media, the company website, even advertisements that are run on TV is also um, actionable. If it does not have a claim that is valid, then it, it cannot be run on television as well. Um, there are uh, different types of claims that you can make for um, a device. Uh, some of the claims are revolving around the safety of the device, some revolve around the performance, and some are just technical claims. Um, for the purpose of a clinical evaluation, your uh, claim should be centered around clinical safety and performance claims. Technical claims are related to um, the design features or um, something that the device can do that does not necessarily result in a clinical benefit. Those kinds of claims are technical claims. And since they do not have any benefit to either the patient or the user, it uh, does not make too much sense to present them in a clinical evaluation report. Technical claims can always be presented in your technical file, um, but for a clinical evaluation, it's usually restricted to clinical safety and performance claims. Um, so the EUMDR Article 253 defines a clinical benefit as a positive impact that, um, that a device has on the health of an individual. And it is necessary that these benefits are um, meaningful and can be measured, mainly because, as I mentioned earlier, the goal of a clinical evaluation is to show that your device is able to achieve these clinical benefits. So if they are measurable and they have a meaningful outcome, that is the only way that you can prove that your device actually achieves these benefits or produces these benefits in the users. Clinical benefit is slightly different from clinical performance. Clinical performance is what the device does. Um, it, it can be the same as the intended use of the device. And then what impact this intended use or what impact this performance has on the patient is the clinical benefit. And for demonstrating your uh, safety and performance claims, you have to identify the clinical benefit that is achieved. And then you have to identify the endpoints for these benefits and demonstrate these endpoints within your CER. Um, for the purpose of the CER, there are two types of benefits, one which are direct and one which are indirect. So the direct benefits are um, claims which are uh, benefits which the patient can um, uh, experience by the use of the device directly. So uh, for example, say guide wires, they assist other medical device in achieving their intended purpose. As such, a guide wire does not have any um, medical benefit to the patient. It does not um, either treat or diagnose any condition on its own, but in combination with say a stent or another interventional device, it helps in revascularization or um, it helps in um, delivering valves or, or any other type of interventional devices. So on their own, though they do not have a clinical benefit, they have an indirect benefit by facilitating the delivery of another device to um, the location where it is intended. So identifying whether your device has a direct or indirect um, benefit is, is very essential at the very beginning of your clinical evaluation. This helps you plan what type of data you should have to demonstrate um, uh, that your device achieves the clinical benefit. And it also helps you to come up with justifications in case you do not have clinical data for, for your devices. Um, so under the GSPRs, to demonstrate compliance with the GSPRs, it is expected that all devices have clinical data, but there are exceptions to this rule. So, to identify if your device falls under these categories, which can be exempted and which need not have clinical data, it is essential to identify what type of clinical benefits are associated with your device. So there are uh, clinical benefits where um, it helps um, in diagnosis or it helps in managing a procedure uh, and that procedure in turn has a positive impact on the patient. So again, this, this is one of those cases where the device as such does not have a direct medical benefit to the patient. It only has a positive impact on patient management. And this cannot be demonstrated um, 
via clinical evidence except uh, clinical evidence for the main device or the main procedure that is being conducted. Uh, I will go over some more examples in the later slides. Um, for now, we um, there are a couple of guidances and um, a couple of documents that help in determining what uh, clinical endpoints are, what counts as a valid endpoint, um, what type of endpoints um, can be considered so some of these guidances are um, the MedDev 2.7 bar 1 Rev 4. Um, then there's the MDCG 2026 and MDCG 2013. All of these um, have sections that are specific to clinical benefits. And uh, under MedDev, the, the Appendix A uh, 7.2 section, it gives detailed information on how clinical benefits can be identified. It gives information on... Um, how these endpoints for these clinical benefits can be identified, uh, what, uh, what factors you should con consider. Uh, for example, um, it is essential to consider the duration of the clinical benefit uh, experienced by the patient. Um, is your device uh, resulting in a short-term um, short -term benefit? Is your device resulting in a benefit that extends over years? If there is an improvement in quality of life, how long is that expected to last? These are some of the things that you are expected to identify and call out within your clinical evaluation plan and then demonstrate via suitable data in your clinical evaluation report. So oftentimes it's seen that um, identifying these endpoints becomes a little bit of an issue. We're not very sure what kind of endpoints we should consider for each benefit. In that case, if you are unsure of what endpoints you should consider, the different sources that you can look at to determine what endpoints you should consider are um, there are guidances and consensus documents around the clinical condition of interest that your, that your device either treats or diagnoses. Then there are industry standards, again, for that particular clinical condition or procedure that your device does. And state-of-the-art. State-of-the-art is also another very important source from where you can identify endpoints. Um, so let's take the example of state-of-the-art. Uh, let's say we're talking about, um, again, um, let's go with the example of a catheter. You're talking about a catheter that uh, delivers a stent and therefore um, helps in revascularization. So what type of endpoints should you consider and how do you make them measurable? So for a catheter, let's say it's it's fairly um, simple to assume that one of the endpoints should be a safety endpoint would be that uh, there is um, limited mortality, um, morbidity, there's limited dissections associated with the use of your device. So when you say limited that endpoint is valid. So having less dissections or having uh, less um, mortality is an endpoint, but it is not measurable. So how do you make it measurable? By quantifying it, by saying um, my device has dissections in the range of say 2%, 3%, 4%. So adding a value beside that makes that endpoint measurable and quantifiable, something that you can demonstrate via your data. So how do you come up with this uh, values and percentages? How do you determine if these values and percentages are acceptable? If you say, um, say 50%, your device will obviously have dissections less than 50%. But is that, is that a good claim to make? Is that something that is valid? Um, how you can determine that is to check the state of the art. So say you identify a benchmark device, you go through literature for this benchmark device. See, um, what kind of data is available for your benchmark device. And if your benchmark device, say, has a dissection rate of 4% or 5%, you can set that as your limit for your own device. And then you can look through your data, your own clinical investigations, um, the literature published on your device to check if your device has dissections that fall within this rate. So that would be a valid claim and a measurable claim, something that you can easily demonstrate via the data that you have. So going through state of the art and industry standards is, um, is a very good way of identifying endpoints and quantifying them. Uh, industry standards also often provide values that you can use in your claims. Um, for example, uh, say you're considering um, a device that is used for radiation therapy. 
So there are several standards that surround uh, what is the safe dose rate that that can be uh, dispersed by a, a radiation therapy device? So that value you can consider as your endpoint, and then you can say that my device um, safely delivers this dose rate uh, within so and so square um, meters or within so and so area. Uh, the industry standards also specify um, certain things like uh, what is considered accurate and precise during radiation. Uh, therapy or during radiation delivery by a device. So those are things also that you can cite in your performance objectives. You can say that my uh, device follows the industry standards, meaning it delivers radiation within this particular range. It delivers uh, with this accuracy, with this precision, and those values can be obtained from industry standards and consensus documents. So once you have those values, you can go through your internal documents to see if your um, risk management documents and your internal testing, as well as any clinical investigations that you have, support these claims. Um, there is there is a scenario where um, you cannot have direct um, clinical outcomes, and therefore you cannot have direct clinical claims. These come into play when you are considering indirect benefits. So like I said, indirect benefits are for those devices where um, they do not have a direct effect on the patient. They are not directly involved in either the treatment or diagnosis of a clinical condition um, that, that a patient is experiencing. So in that case, you have two options. One is to say that your device's success um, or your device's safety and performance objectives can be only demonstrated through the safety and performance objectives of the main device with which it is used. Um, for example, a device that measures, say, blood pressure uh, during a dialysis um, during a dialysis uh, procedure, uh, the actual device that measures the blood pressure it has no diagnostic value. Neither does it have any treatment value, the, the value entirely depends on the device that is performing the dialysis. But I can say that with data that helps me identify the flow rate or um, the access flow rate through the dialysis machine, I'm able to optimize the, dial the uh, dialysis settings and therefore deliver um, the best dialysis therapy to the patient. It's helping me optimize the patient management. Um, so how do you demonstrate optimization of patient management? That is not something that will have a clinical outcome that you can measure. That is not something that will have a, a quantifiable um, number that you can measure. So in, in these cases is where you use something that we call surrogate endpoints. Uh, so surrogate endpoints are basically laboratory measurements or physical science, in some cases biomarkers, that are used as a substitute for a meaningful endpoint. So in, in cases where we are not able to directly measure how the patient feels or how the patient is benefited by our device, we can use a physical sign or another laboratory measurement, which is an indication of this final endpoint that we are hoping to demonstrate. So in the previous example that I had given, a device that measures flow rate, I am saying that by accurately measuring flow rate, my device is helping to optimize the dialysis therapy. So my surrogate endpoint is just accurate and reproducible measurement of flow rate. If I am able to demonstrate that, I can extrapolate that data to say that because I'm able to accurately and reproducibly able to measure uh, the flow rate, I'm able to optimize dialysis and dialysis is associated with uh, beneficial patient outcomes, which can be measured for the dialysis system on its own. So you use a surrogate endpoint to demonstrate the final clinical outcome. Now for these surrogate endpoints, you obviously cannot have clinical data to demonstrate it. It is in these situations that you can call on the exception and use non-clinical data to demonstrate compliance with your GSPRs and to demonstrate that your device achieves um, its clinical claim or uh, has an actual benefit, it's only in this case that you can use non-clinical data. So it is expected to be a measure of the therapy, 
uh, that you are delivering and therefore it is considered a final endpoint in its own right but for any devices which do not have a direct benefit it is only for those devices that you can consider a surrogate endpoint for devices which have a direct effect on the patient um there are very rare scenarios where you can use a surrogate endpoint unless it is unethical to measure the final outcome um and to have clinical data to support that there is no other scenario where you can use a surrogate endpoint for a device which has a direct benefit or a direct effect on patient treatment or diagnosis um next one is uh, what type of data can you use to support your claims so as i mentioned before for direct clinical benefits which have clinical endpoints that are measurable you have to provide clinical data and there are different types of clinical data that you can use for example um investigations that are either sponsored by the manufacturer or that you can find from external databases these clinical investigations may be investigator led or they could be sponsored by another device but has used your device as a competitor or um a comparator um so those type of clinical investigations can be used published literature on humans data from any uh, registries where your device is being considered uh, data from an another device which is used a subject device um which does not have direct clinical data so um and then usability studies or uh, human factor studies that have um relevant data pertaining to your clinical endpoint um the next type of data is non clinical data and again these can only be used for um devices that do not have a direct clinical benefit and for which you have identified surrogate endpoints and to demonstrate these surrogate endpoints you can use non clinical data this non clinical data can either be obtained from bench testing verification validation studies um or they can come from pre clinical studies that were conducted by the manufacturer usually this is biocompatibility data um there are not um it cannot be used for a performance endpoint but biocompatibility data can be used when you are trying to claim a safety endpoint um and then you can also use published animal studies these published animal studies are usually for those devices where it is unethical to have clinical data like um establishing that your device uh, accurately performs something um just to have that data conducting a study on humans if it is unethical in that scenario you can use data from animal studies as well um so we have a system at salagens that we use to handle all of our uh, literature data uh, one of the major sources of clinical information and in some cases animal studies or um, uh, non clinical testing that is published is via literature search and handling large amounts of data from the literature search is a little difficult um and to make this task a lot easier we have a, a system within salagens that we use which is called captis um it it is an automated system that facilitates faster literature reviews and it helps you uh, perform adverse event analysis as well because the system is um it has the feature to download a tplc data that is total product life cycle data so and it has um uh, this the feature to download adverse event data from mod as well um so the adverse event analysis as well as the literature uh, reviews and analysis is a lot easier with the system it is integrated with a majority of um the commonly used databases like pubmed google scholar cochrane uh, euro pmc so uh, conducting a search on captis is easy and then screening the articles and documenting um the l1 and l2 screening and um tagging these articles is also very easy it's something that um simplifies the process of literature search and considerably reduces the amount of time that you spend on this particular activity um specific to claims it helps uh, for bulk import of search data and then it automatically imports uh, any uh, free full text that are available um there are audit trails for each article so you can um, check what has happened with the article from the time when it was searched um there are also automatic triggers uh, for any report updates which is very useful when um, there are multiple people working on a document 
there is the option for optimized data collection and storage. And uh, there are also forms that you can customize based on what you are looking for. So in, in case you are looking for a particular claim or in case you're looking for a particular um, data set that you require to demonstrate compliance with your claims, tagging those articles, looking for specific keywords, it, it becomes very simple with this um, system. And uh, it also acts as a repository for all of the data that you have, not, not only for a single project, but multiple projects. Um, there is also a correlation that can be done between um, different uh, searches done on the same um, same device. So you can you can tag them, you can tag the articles, you can um, define if an article helps you uh, support a specific safety claim, you can define if an article helps you support a specific um, performance claim, and then you can filter out these articles once you've tagged them. So apart from summarizing them under DUE, you can also separately pull out an export for just articles supporting your claims. You can also um, create summaries on the CAPTA system. Uh, you can highlight important data that can be referred later on. You can also have the system where you tag or leave comments for specific people. So if there are multiple people working on the system, you can leave comments for them. You can, um, you can uh, action a particular article based on what you feel is relevant, but leave a comment so that everyone is aware of why this action was taken. You can also leave notes on articles. Um, um, so it, it, it's, it's very easy to use. It's very user-friendly and it helps um, keeping all of the data together. Um, so if, um, if this is available, it, it significantly reduces the amount of time that we spend on um, the literature activity. Um, so, so next, I just want to go over some sample studies that we have. Uh, so I have uh, already mentioned this in the previous slides. For direct benefits, you can consider devices like stents. Um, in, for stents, uh, one of the performance objectives that you can consider is successful revascularization, um, the percentage restenosis or number of uh, revascularization procedures that need to be repeated. These are directly related to the stents and all of them are quantifiable. Um, so going through the state of the art for a benchmark device or going through industry standards, you can come up with values that are acceptable against each of these performance criteria. Um, same goes for the safety criteria. You can use the industry standards or uh, state of the art data to determine um, the percentage of uh, dissections, deaths, or MIs that can be considered acceptable for um, the device of interest. Similarly, for indirect benefits, um, like I said, there are two types, one which can claim the benefit of the main device and the second one where you use surrogate endpoints because you're claiming a complete indirect benefit. And based on the surrogate endpoints, you're going to demonstrate that your device achieves its intended purpose. So for this example, again, there's guide wires where all of the safety and performance benefits are same as those of stents. So you can say that my guide wire um, can be considered uh, as it, it has uh, successfully performed its intended use if the revascularization is successful. If the number of dissections are within range, then your guide wire can be considered safe. Um, so you can use the same safety and performance endpoints, although identifying that data becomes a little difficult. Um, but again, uh, you can tag articles based on which particular stents you are considering, which type of device you want uh, to specify with use with your guide wire. So these are things that you can consider while claiming benefits of the main device. Um, you can also consider surrogate endpoints. Like I mentioned for devices used for monitoring procedures, um, during ECMO and dialysis, it is important to monitor the flow rate or the blood flow through the system as well as uh, recirculation um, and other factors which help to optimize the ECMO and dialysis. So devices which do this activity for them having um, a clinical endpoint through ECMO or dialysis is difficult. So you can use surrogate endpoints and just say reproducible and accurate measurements of any of these parameters helps the physician optimize ECMO and therefore demonstrating that your device 
can accurately or reproduce and reproducibly measure these parameters is a surrogate endpoint and therefore it is achieving its uh, clinical benefit. So in our experience, we have uh, received some NB observations on our previous CERs that surround claims. Uh, one of the major observations that we've re received is that um, the claims are not measurable or verifiable. So if you make a very generic claim, like our device performs well, um, it is not a measurable or verifiable claim. You, you, you have to define what you mean by performs well. You have to define what clinical um, condition or what clinical endpoint you are considering to say that it performs well. And it always has to be something that you can demonstrate via data within the CER. Um, we've also received um, observations that say that the clinical claim is more technical rather than clinical. Um, so saying that my device has, it, uh, it's, um, say it's easily portable. So the size is only XX into XX centimeters. This is a technical claim. It has no direct clinical benefit to the patient. And it is not something that you can demonstrate except to show that this is the design of the device. So these type of claims are not are not expected to be a part of the CER. You can have them in your technical file and it could have benefits that it is easily portable or um, it's uh, easier to use. Um, but then it's again, it's not uh, something that has a clinical benefit and therefore it need not be included in the clinical evaluation. There are scenarios where uh, devices which are new or in some cases, devices which have been on the market but do not have clinical investigations have used non-clinical data to demonstrate compliance with the claims or to demonstrate that the device achieves the claims. In this case, a justification should be provided for why you're using the non-clinical data when it is possible to use clinical data. And if this justification is not available, then um, the use of non-clinical data is not um, usually allowed by the notified body, unless it's a device where it you cannot use clinical data or um, it's unethical to conduct clinical experiments for the purpose of demonstrating the endpoint for your device. Only in that case can you use non-clinical data. So a, at any rate, a justification has to be added for the use of non-clinical data. Um, Another uh, uh, concern has been the incorrect identification of endpoints. Um, uh, so for example, if I say that uh, my device helps in reducing pain, if I am not producing the pain score that I use, the pain scale that I use to identify if it is actually reducing pain, then it's not an endpoint that is uh, valid. If I'm, if I'm not able to demonstrate it via the data that I have, it's not a valid endpoint and it's not a measurable endpoint. It's not an endpoint that I have sufficient data for. So it is something that the notified body uh, uh, points out during uh, the evaluation, the, during the review of the clinical evaluation. Another one is not enough clinical data. Um, if the clinical data, you have just say one article or a very limited study on um, a small number of patients for demonstrating a particular claim, um, it, it will not be considered. It has to be statistically relevant um, and significant data. If it is in statistically significant, then it is likely going to be rejected by the notified body as not sufficient data for a particular claim. Um, one important thing to remember is you can say these are uh, claims that are going to be or that are not currently um, put on any uh, IFU or any website or any print or media, but they are claims that you're hoping to demonstrate via PMCF data, which is acceptable provided it is not already published for your device. Um, the notified body does agree to having those claims within the CER. Um, so with that, we come to the end of the session. Um, and um, just to run through what we've gone over so far, uh, you for having an effective clinical evaluation, one of the first and most important steps is to show that your device achieves uh, the specific intended use. So your in first and foremost focus while uh, doing a clinical evaluation is to identify the objectives. What are you hoping to demonstrate via this clinical evaluation? These objectives come from determining the claims that you're hoping to 
establish for your device. Um, it is not always necessary that your claims have to be something that is apart from your intended use. You can always say that you claim that your device functions as intended and achieves so-and-so clinical benefit and then establish how you're going to demonstrate that it achieves this clinical benefit, which is a perfectly reasonable claim and an objective to make. Um, next, the next step is to check how much data you have for demonstrating these objectives. Do you have sufficient data? Do you have the right kind of data? Is it clinical? Is it non-clinical? Is it going to be accepted? Um, if, it, if, if you have only non-clinical data, is there a reason? Is it something that you will be able to justify? Um, and then the last step is if you do not have enough data to demonstrate a particular claim, or if you do not have enough data to to demonstrate any of the objectives that you have identified. You have to reevaluate if you are claiming the right things. Does your device need a design change or does it need some kind of re-evaluation to make sure that it in fact um, ha demonstrates these claims or is it just that you have to rephrase the claims in such a way that you can demonstrate it via the data that you have? So doing this process, this entire process of identifying your claims and checking the amount of data that you have should be done at the very beginning of a clinical evaluation because it does result in change of the IFU in certain cases, um, making sure that the verbiage is not something that can um, mislead the user or the patient. Um, so doing this at the very beginning of your clinical evaluation, before you start drafting the CER, before you even uh, start putting in all of the data is, is a very good practice. And uh, that is how we work at uh, Celligence to make sure that we have all the data in place before starting off the clinical evaluation, just so that we don't go back and change the IFU or the operator manual, which results in a change of the entire uh, evaluation process where you have to go back and rerun the searches and redo everything. So to avoid that rework, it is best to do this at the very beginning of your clinical evaluation. Um, at this point, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If you do have questions, um, please feel free to use the Q&A function. I also do see a hand raised, so we will um, get to that as well. I want to make sure that I have um, Smidula on the line with me. Hi, Kelly. I'm here. Excellent. Um, we do have um, a couple questions that came in. Um, does the class of, this classification of claims specific to a, re a region or is it in general? Uh, it is in, in general. It's, it's um, not something that I've seen that is, is region-based. Um, for EU MDR, it is a general requirement. All right, excellent. Um, and we have a couple questions here from Guy. Um, do you see the difference? Do you see a difference between clinical claims made by marketing, which may be specific and numerous, versus benefits in the CER? If so, how do you see the relationship between specific clinical claims used by marketing versus broader benefit um, claims in the CER? For example, a wound dressing where the benefit is heals wounds, but marketing wants to differentiate based on multiple more specific claims, such as reduces damage to wound during removal. Um, so usually what we've seen is if the marketing team wants to split it into multiple benefits, they can do that provided it maps to one umbrella claim within the CER. Um, so in this case, say uh, you're talking about, uh, say different types of wounds that can be um, healed by a certain, um, by a certain uh, dressing or uh, different locations or uh, that, that type of claim is fine. You can call out different locations within your marketing material and just say heals wounds within the CER. But like I said, all claims should map to a specific umbrella claim and you should have proof within the umbrella claim that supports all of these individual claims as well. If it does not support one particular um, statement within your marketing um, within your marketing system or within your uh, database or within your website, then that has to be taken off because we have seen instances where the notified body has said this is there in your, um, in your website and it's not a part of your CER 
it's not covered by clinical data and we want you to change it. So that has happened in a couple of cases. Excellent. Um, another question from Guy, how would you see the relationship between uh, specific clinical claims Oh, is this the same question? Yes, it is just reworded slightly differently. Um, I also saw a raised hand um, a second ago. I want to make sure that we, um, I'm going to ask to unmute here just to make your, um, let's see here, allowed to talk. There we go. All right. Uh, can you, uh, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, I have, uh, like, everything was good because I also worked in claims. My only specific doubt is, uh, so, claims or clinical benefits will be always a device. Uh, it is not only, it is like a patient's perspective. It will not be device perspective. If I see one slide, it is showing, like, uh, a clinical benefit. It is showing, like, number of uh, procedures happened or number of times the uh, revascularization happened. So it, it will all be dependent with respect to physician's purpose. It will not be patient perspective, right? How can we categorize that situation into uh, benefit to the patient? Because the clinical benefit definition is in positive impact with the patient, right? So if you're using, um, say, if you're using one device to do one revascularization versus your device is not able to achieve the revascularization and then you have to go back and do it again means the patient has to undergo an additional procedure or the patient has to be under anesthesia longer and the procedure is prolonged so shorter procedure time um yeah. less yeah less surgery that is a patient benefit so, yeah, so your claim which we are using, yeah sorry sorry Karen. yes yeah, so the so the benefit is that because there are lesser um, revascularizations or lesser uh, re-operations that are required, uh, there's lesser uh, uh, whatever uh, um, fallback due to surgeries or due to extended anesthesia time, there's lesser uh, risk associated with it. Yes, thank you. That is what I had out because in direct or indirect clinical benefit, there was terminologies which were used in this way, but the content what you told now, it is patient's perspective. Uh, like a number of procedures done can be reduced. That is patient's perspective. That can be taken as a claim or benefit. So that is one of the doubts. And can we have the slides and recording session, Kelly? Yes. Because, yes. because um, that will help us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we will have a um, a follow-up email, a sort of thank you summary email that will we'll have those links uh, provided. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly, for this wonderful presentation, actually, because I worked in 4,000 clinical claims for almost many of the devices, but this also helping helped me a lot actually to know in depth regarding because I used lots of documents, but with respect to surrogate endpoints, this is a new concept which I had today. So nice session, thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple more uh, questions that have um, come in through. Um, I think one of them might've been early on, um, before, uh, just dif the differentiating um, between claims and clinical benefits with an example. Um, so just the example that was given earlier. So you're claiming lesser um, uh, CD vascularization procedures. That's a claim. And your benefit to the patient is that they have a lesser duration under general anesthesia, lesser surgeries, lesser risk, uh, lesser reoperations, and that, that'll be the benefit to the patient. Um, similarly, say for um, a device which is a bone hemostat, my claim would be that it is completely resorbable, um, and the clinical benefit would be that, um, or my claim would be that it's resorbable by this amount of time. It's resorbable within six hours, within 16 hours, within a day, and then the benefit would be that uh, the risks associated with a non resorbable hemostat, such as um, granulomas or um, infections acting as a nidus of infection, those risks are reduced. So that is the benefit. And your claim is that it's resorbable. Excellent. All right, we have a couple more that have come in. Um, is there an overlap between intended use claims and clinical benefit? So your intended use uh, usually is your claim. 
uh, whatever your device does is what you're claiming. If you have claims apart from the intended use, um, say uh, the device does something in specific that is the intended use versus you're claiming that it does it better than a device in the market, that is, that is a claim. So the intended use also can be a claim. You can have claims that are different from the intended use as well, something which is not within the statement of intended use. Um, and then benefit is just the outcome of your intended use or your uh, claim. Excellent. Um, can you claim process supports clinical claim? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really understand that. Uh, uh, medical what? process, sorry, I see uh, she added the second part. Can you um, claim medical su process supports clinical claim? Um, can you maybe give me an example of, of what do you mean by that? Uh, medical process meaning? Um, and if you are still uh, on the call, if you want to raise your hand, we can um, put it, uh, have answer your question that way. Um, in the meantime, I will jump to the next question. Um, is there an example or guidance with an example of the type of performance um, or safety claims? Um, so the MEDEV 2.7.1 uh, REF4, uh, it gives you very detailed guidance on what type of claims you should have and what the nature of the claim should be. They don't have examples, but it gives you a pretty detailed guidance on what, um, what you should consider for claims. Um, the MDCG document does give you uh, very few examples on direct and indirect um, benefits, but not claims. Um, it looks like we got a little bit more um, detail from Anne um, about the, the care pathway as an example. Not sure so you're talking about uh, you're talking about a, a monitoring uh, system, maybe some some sort of device that helps in monitoring. Can we claim that the the way that it's monitoring um, as support for our claim is is that the question? And if you could. Um... If you have if you have a little bit more, uh, you could uh, raise your hand on the uh, our panelist side, and I can ask you to unmute, um, or we can follow up with you. Ah, um, somewhat, uh, and and she can uh, write in separately to you as well, uh, which will work as well. Um, yeah. Well, we have uh, another question here. During an annual update of a CER, can we use the clinical literature data for a particular safety or performance as a claim? Yes your clinical literature data can be used to supplement um, uh, safety and performance claims within a CER. Excellent. And we have just a couple more minutes here left. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to submit, um, I have just a couple more. Um, will all diagnostics uh, devices have indirect claims? Um, not really. So there are cases where a diagnostic device can have a a direct claim. Um, if the diagnosis is directly resulting in um, identifying a, a life-threatening condition or a, um, a disease that requires immediate treatment, then it is it is a it is a claim with a valid clinical outcome. So, um, for example, let me say um, a device that measures heart rate and it identifies arrhythmia. Um, so that is a that is a. Um, uh, um, a diagnostic device, but with a direct claim. So you can say that identifying the arrhythmia helps you prevent any sequelae from having that arrhythmia prolonged. So you can treat it immediately and uh, that that's like an outcome that is uh, favorable. Excellent. Um, we have another one that came in on websites and in marketing material. We often refer to latest publications with data on our device, um, including off label. Will this no longer be allowed unless it is included in clinical evaluation report first? It's it's not disallowed. You can have um, data on your uh, website that supports an off label use, but you you ideally should not be claiming it until you have enough proof for that particular off-label use. You cannot use it as a part of the intended use and you cannot claim it as um, you cannot claim it as something your device does. You can say that these are um, 
uh, these are uh, publications that support the use of the device in so and so situation, but we still do not claim it. So you have to add a disclaimer to that. Unless you have supported this in your clinical evaluation, unless it has been approved of by the notified body, it cannot be used as a direct claim in your marketing material either. You, you can mention that it is an off-label use, which is supported by these publications. Um, is it mandatory to cite claims in every CER or CEP? Um, so the, the objective of having the CER is to show that your device is useful and does something. So it is mandatory to demonstrate some kind of clinical benefit, either direct or indirect. And without that, uh, the notified body would come back and say, so we, we have earlier submitted documents that said we have no um, claims because our idea of claims was apart from the edit something. So when we went ahead and presented that statement, the notified body came back and said, if your device doesn't have a purpose, if it doesn't have a benefit, then why is it even in the market? So identifying the purpose of your device, identifying what it does for patients or for users is mandatory. You have to have it as a part of the CEP and the CER for it to make sense to have your device in the market. We had an anonymous question come in here. Uh, can you create claims which are not in CER using literatures for marketing purposes? Um, I would say no. Again, it, it has to be, somebody has to be validating these claims. Somebody has to be saying that there is sufficient evidence for these claims. So if you're using it in your marketing literature, um, in your uh, in your website and you're saying these literature supported, somebody has to say this amount of literature is enough. So if it's not in the CER, who is going to verify if that data is enough? Who's going to check if if the amount of clinical evidence is enough? So anything that that is used for your marketing should be approved um, by the notified body or by the regulatory authority before it goes on there. All right, excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We are at 11 o'clock um, here in Central Time. Um, I thank you all for joining us today and thank you, uh, Smir Dula, for your presentation and for Celligence for um, uh, presenting with us today. Um, we look forward to your participation in future Q1 events. Um, and with that, I will uh, let you on with the rest of your day. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you next time.